Welcome to the spoiler room. Eight weeks of Alfred Hitchcock. The next eight episodes, we will be covering some films that are known and not so known of Alfred Hitchcock's. We hope you enjoy the show and aren't too scared. If you do get scared, please pause the podcast, have a drink, come back and finish the podcast. Thank you and enjoy. And welcome everyone. Yes, eight weeks of Hitchcock. We are winding a down and as promised from last week's episode, I warned you, we're talking about North by Northwest 1959 directed by Mr. Alfred Hitchcock and tonight I got a great crew member with me to discuss uh, this film starring uh, the one and only uh, Cary Grant it is none other than the diva of the spoiler room it is Dawn hello Dawn ready it's just you and me mano y mano against uh, North by Northwest well you know this is actually one of my favorite uh, Hitchcock villains so I'm all for it Really? Really? Yeah. Van Damme is, huh? Uh, the combination of Van Damme and Leonard, Leonard. actually. Oh, yeah. Well, this, this is going to make this even more interesting. Awesome. Well, uh, did you want to try to give the synopsis of this film? or I did it last week. You can. You did. You did do it last week. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Well, I haven't done it for a while. Let's, let's see if I can give it a go. Uh, there is the IMDb uh summary but let's just say uh Cary Grant plays Mr. Roger Thornhill he's an advertising agent a big guy he's always busy always on the run but when there is a case of mistaken identity and he is mistaken for a spy his life gets turned upside down and he finds himself on the run framed for murder being chased by some very nasty individuals in a climactic ending that ends on Mount Rushmore. And all along the way, he discovers that uh, there may be true love out there for him, although it is more in an awkward sort of way. <laughs> um. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so it stars, uh, this is, would you say, I was talking to my uh, uh, son uh, about this because he, he, he came in. Uh, for the last hour of it and i'll tell you later we'll, we'll go into a little later some of his thoughts on it um does this seem like the most hollywood alfred hitchcock film <laughs> yes and no um as far as production value mm-hmm. i would definitely go yes yeah as far as some of the things that they slipped in god no <laughs> A number of things they slipped in. Mm, slipped <laughs> in. <laughs> yes, that's fully intentional, folks. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to open this film, this up right now by just saying um, it wasn't until tonight I truly caught the meeting for the North by Northwest title. Because <laughs> it always kind of confused me a little bit like, why is I mean, because I was looking at titles of other Hitchcock films in the U.S. and they're pretty literal. You know, Vertigo guy has Vertigo. You know, man who knew too much. Well, he's a guy who witnessed something too much. You know, mm-hmm. rear window. It, you're looking out a rear window. Notorious, the the one girl involved. Her dad was notorious. You know, okay. And then North by Northwest. I'm like, I've always kind of wondered, like, oh. Okay, yeah, they're kind of moving in a direction. And then there was one scene near the end of this movie, just before the third act, that I dawned on me and I slapped my head on and I was like, wow, really? How did I not miss? How did I not see that? The true meaning I thought I found was the fact he gets on a Northwest airplane to head North Dakota. North. Oh, North. Yeah. Dakota. Yeah, I'm yeah. slow. <laughs> I'm so slow. 
<laughs> but <laughs> most literal uh, title of a Alfred Hitchcock film, maybe. Well, not really. I guess all of his were. But well, did you did you happen to? Uh, you mentioned IMDb. Did you happen to look at some of the other um, test uh, titles they had? No, Something I about didn't. Abraham Lincoln's nose. Did they really? Yeah, wow. they really did. It, it's that's weird. Uh, apparently, yeah. apparently, one of the um, one of the shticks that they continuously joked about doing was having Cary Grant in hiding in Lincoln's nose, having a sneezing fit. Oh my God! Wow. And it was vetoed by the the park, actually. Oh, um, which was which was a, probably a pretty smart choice. But yeah, that was one of the um, that was one of the shticks they wanted to to put in there. According to, thank you. Um, sorry, just got a glass of wine delivered to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, oh, oh yeah, I'm looking for it. Okay, here it is. Uh, the working go. title was in a northwesterly direction. Oh boy! Uh, then uh, ahead of the story department at MGS, so why don't you call it North by Northwest? Lehman says that he and Hitchcock adopted that as the new working title, always assuming that they'd come up with something better later. Yeah. Hitchcock jokingly wanted to call it the man in Lincoln's nose. That's the one. There you go. But claimed the idea was vetoed by the park commissioner. Other working titles included Breathless, In a Northwest Direction, and The CIA Story. Wow, that would have been two on the nose. That definitely, it would have given away the, it would have given things away way too fast. The CIA Story? Yeah, that would, yeah. That, that would have been just two on the nose no pun intended for the man in Lincoln's <laughs> nose. <laughs> although the man in lincoln's nose was definitely a, it, it would definitely have been an interesting it'd be fun to see on the marquee <laughs> i imagine the park commissioner poo-pooed the idea because then it would have caused people because it was cary grant caused people to crawl up into lincoln's nose uh, yeah, I imagine there might have been problems with that. You know, uh, <laughs> so look, I'm sitting right where Cary Grant was sitting when he was sneezing. I'm the man <laughs> in Lincoln's nose. You know, oh, yeah. I'm sure they have enough issues with people trying to get over there that probably would have caused a lot of stupid people to mimic the scene. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see that. So. We're going to jump around probably tonight on this movie, folks, because I know a lot, all these Alfred Hitchcock films, as we've done in the other episodes, uh, all these Alfred Hitchcock films have been beat for beat broken down. So we may be jumping around a bit because then the reason I warn you that now is because the other title they have, Breathless, that actually would have worked, I think, uh, just because of the scenes between uh all all the ladies love of Cary Grant and uh, the wonderful Eva Marie Saint as Eve Kendall uh yeah Don we were talking about it the early scene where Cary Grant's on the run from the cops now because he's been framed for a uh, possible UN murder and we get to see the quickest newspaper headline ever to be released um yep <laughs> so these two beat and wow, if you think Alfred Hitchcock can direct suspense well and get you on the edge of your seat, I have not seen many films uh, with a scene where these two are in the train after he's, uh, she hides him from the cops that has been more steamy. Oh my I Lord. had forgotten how overtly sexual this movie is oh my god from from when they first meet to the dinner scene that that dinner scene it's just them two talking but holy crap that gets you hot under the collar a little bit with the way they're talking because of the way her character is i mean what would you think of eve and, and these rather uh, uh i <clears throat> I loved that they made her an incredibly strong 
and empowered woman, not just, I mean, not just a strong woman in the same way that she was a strong woman in the way that Grace Kelly was strong in rear window. Yes. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't going to let a man define her. At least she didn't come across that way in these first scenes. It was very much, she was going to take what she wanted and then she was done. Oh yeah. She, she was always in control and she knew she was in control. There was no apologies and no waiting for, uh, and no waiting for him. Like, permission or anything yeah Uh, yeah there was there was no permission she was going to make the first move yes i loved that about the way they wrote this character the first and second and third and and roger thornhill just could not he just he buckles very quickly (laughs) oh yeah because we're, we're still talking 1959 here. So you still have the kind of 50s era male here. And it's Cary's Grant, man's man, you know, mm-hmm. the man every guy wants to be and every girl wants to be with type of, you know, actor. Even, even if he is a little bit on the, uh, <clears throat> um, okay, he was in his like mid 50s. Yes, he was. Late 50s. Mm-hmm. Even 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 by today's standards, that's pushing it. It is, but he was he still had his charm, and he still was you know mm-hmm. had the eye of the the female demograph, so to speak. So, <laughs> but they weren't trying. To, I mean, and also they weren't trying to make him young. No, just they, young enough. Yeah, they didn't in this one. This isn't. This isn't like the blob, you know, this isn't yeah. like we're taking, <laughs> we're taking him and trying to make him, you know, a 50 year old guy look 20 something, or in that case, you know, a 30 year old guy look 18. No, no, they're, you know, they're, they, they give him just a little bit of a knock down his age, just a little bit, but, um, she really has a lot of power and strength and you're right. Just empowerment, everything about her, um, is a bit surprising for a 50s female character. I, It's just a simple truth, folks. I mean... Yeah. But it does seem to be fairly common in Hitchcock films. Yes. He does like his women strong. He likes his women classy, but very, very strong. He does. And Eva Marie Saint is really strong. Well, for about... 95 percent of the film till something goes screwy but uh, <laughs> but you know, it's it's well explained it is well explained though it is completely well explained i will say that it's just yeah a notice a little bit of a noticeable change from when mm-hmm. we first meet her um you know not taking down her character or anything but uh yeah i love eva marie saint and these early scenes between her and and uh Cary Grant and you know Roger and Eve holy man those are steamy quite the the banter and it, it and again i mentioned it would you say it, it alfred showing he can take that talent of tension and fear and put you on the edge of your seat forever and still take that talent and bring the same to a very emotional scene did you notice that during that conversation they actually had to edit and change what she said it did seem like they changed some things because the quote that she said in the movie was i never talk about love on an empty stomach yes but they had changed it and originally it was i never make love on an empty stomach oh Oh, those those dang standards they had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, there's a there's a few things that I'm shocked that got past the, uh, yeah. Oh, like what else? What else are you looking? Oh, um, that that end, the very very end. Oh, you mean the the, the final scene and, where they? Yep, where the train goes through, where the train goes into the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a little overly <laughs> metaphored. Well, yeah, it, it would be if it wasn't for the fact that we saw uh, good old Roger Thornhill and Eva 
Eve Kendall in uh, the bed. They had just gotten married, and there's only one bed in the train car. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> and and then there's the whole, and it was done extremely sudden, subtly, in in large part due to the extreme talent of Martin Landau and uh, James Mason, oh, but please. their yes. relationship. Yes, I couldn't believe it. I, I'm watching it. And I've seen this a couple times before. I was going to bring it up. I'm glad you did. First off, Martin Landau, very young Martin Landau, plain Leonard, the right hand man of Mr. Philip Van Dam, played by James Mason, both fantastically. They're the two main villains. Uh, you know, Philip Van Dam's the main villain who thinks uh -huh. uh, Roger Thornhill is actually a spy. They get this scene near the end where Leonard is revealing the secret of eve kindle and yes this is a spoiler room folks as we always say so uh you know that eve is actually a double agent and she's there to spy on the bad guys for the good guys well cia as my son put it good guys in quotes but um he uh they have this discussion and i'm looking at going wait am i reading the scene correctly it, it, it took you to the end to figure that out huh well, it, it was so subtle. It took you to the end to figure it out. It, it did. I, I fully admit I missed any signs earlier because I was a little more focused on the Roger Thornhill story and that. So uh -huh. it, you, you don't really notice it too much. You just think that Leonard is just looking out for Van Damme, but it's not until this end scene where we realize, and this is 59, folks, so this isn't exactly... <laughs> Leonard has more than just devotion to Van Damme because he's a henchman. Um, yeah, that surprised me. The 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 would that be undertones, the homosexual undertones between uh, these two? Uh, uh, no, that would that would. Or there'd be that, overtone. Well, know, something, but yeah, uh, it was it was a it was a definite decision for Martin Martin Landau to play a gay man in love with his employer. Yeah. And that blew me away that that was in there because after, you know, we get to that scene in the house where he's revealing the double agency and, and her, you know, her, uh, and, and that whole conversation and the way the two even look at each other in that, I'm just like, wow, <laughs> they got away with that. There was that, and I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. I wanted to say it was earlier in the series in the show, but I'm second guessing myself now. Where um, Leonard and uh, Van Dam are having a conversation, and oh, it was to, it what was at the end. Again, I'm second guessing work. myself again. Oh, where awesome. Leonard's response to how did you know that? And Leonard's response was women's intuition. Yes. But no, that was that at I'm... the yeah, that was at the end. That was when mm -hmm. he, he was confronting her. Yeah, that when he said that, I'm like, wait, wait. Did did he just <laughs> mm -hmm. which again, folks, we talk about this because this is 1959. Mm-hmm. This is a film with Cary Grant in it. We got. I, I started figuring it out in the scene with the three of them at the auction house. The way oh, he was okay. glaring at her, mm -hmm. trying to come in between them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that you mention it, I totally see it. You know, I didn't see it at first, and then when the, finally the light bulb went on, when I'm just like. Oh, and then you think back on it, and like, oh, oh, well, here it is too, and it's just like, wow. That, in all honesty, took some. That took some guts to work into the film, at this era. Mm -hmm. And again, a tremendous amount of of talent and confidence, because obviously James Mason knew what was going on, and he was. He he was phenomenal and and just yeah. Well, even Cause, even cause you don't you don't know because he never, uh, he never shows his hand that 
number one, he obviously knows. Right. And number two, he's obviously involved with Eve Kendall, but he knows that Leonard is in love with him. So is he bi? I wondered that. I And I was almost thinking maybe it, it, it might be one of those maybe. And because of the times he had to hide it more and especially his position, you know, um, which, you know, it, it makes you wonder with Eve that, you know, he did care for her. He did love her, but um, there was almost a stronger connection between him and Leonard. Oh, definitely. <laughs> you, you know, uh, and yeah, it just, it, when that happened, my mind, it was one of those things where my mind went, just was blown by that because again i go back to it it's all about context and period with some of these films and you look at what they managed to get past what definitely had it been spelled out any clearer to you um would have been poo-pooed by the the board at the time oh definitely <laughs> you know um uh, and, you know, the way he delivers the women's intuition line as well, you're like, okay, well, you can take it the one way because she's a woman, you know, intuition about women. Oh, okay, sure, that way. But if you paid attention to the way their relationship was, you realize. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that that was something that I was like, wow. Well, and then, too, like I said, even though we're talking late 50s, Eve Kendall's character being so strong and so uh, sexually open with a guy, mm -hmm. um, that had to be interesting for audiences to see. Um, you know, it makes me wonder, because we gloss over with nostalgia, viewing from almost practically 2019 we look back at these films and with with such rose-colored glasses and nostalgia saying oh these films were so innocent i can't you know <laughs> we grew up with our parents saying oh uh, the films that we grew up with they were so fun and light and innocent and there was nothing uh dirty about them and my mom loved the Cary Grant movies, she loved the Rock Hudson movies, loved the the beach movies with yes. Frank Avalon and Nanette Funicello. And I watch these now going, innocent? Not dirty? <laughs> um, I really think there was a lot going on in these movies that people chose to ignore. Unless you were the target audience to catch those things. He, right. They had to be so subtle with some of these things that mm -hmm. only if you were the exact person they were targeting, you're not going to catch it because you are absolutely not thinking they would put that in a film. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas we as modern viewing audiences, when we watch stuff, we're looking at stuff all the time like that for stuff, you know, meaning in and, and how was this put in there? But back then they're just sitting down and they're like, Oh, you know, oh well, that's you know, women's intuition. Oh, that's funny, you know, because it's into his intuition and it involves a woman. That's hilarious. Uh -huh. you know? Whereas you know, some people are in the crowd going, Say it, girl. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh and yeah, you're right. Some of, uh, a lot of these films, that's why I love revisiting some of these classics because you look at it and you go, wow, they actually put that in there and got away with it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you know? yep. Of course, it's being an Alfred Hitchcock film. Uh, we have a character in here, Clara Thornhill, who is, okay, drum roll, please. The mother of Roger Thornhill. Damn Alfred and his mothers. What what the heck, Don? Why? What is it? Because here we have Roger. You know, it, 
it took me entirely too long when I saw those two on screen together to figure out that was his mother because they looked entirely too close in age. I thought that was his wife at first. Yeah, yeah. And for, same here, especially the way he referred to her. Yes. It was so um, weird. And, and I think part of that is, I think part of that is obviously questionable casting. Well, yeah. Part of that is... They established, well, later on when he was talking to um, Eve, they established that he was divorced twice and had a responsibility. No, it was when he was kidnapped and he was like, oh, I have a response to my, to my, to my job, to my mother, to my two ex-wives and to the bartenders of the, <laughs> of the yeah. uh, establishments I frequent. Um. But yeah, he definitely Alfred Hitchcock definitely has a thing about mothers. Whew. Yeah, I I it was like I was watching this going, okay, I could see, you know, if she was a wife or something or an aunt, but no no, that's his mother, and his mother is doting over him, and his mother is yes, you know, oh dear, you're just being silly, and I'm just like sitting here going. Oh my God, Alfred! You and your your almost every single movie we get a mother. <laughs> it's like, wow, man, you you got some issues, I think. Uh, <laughs> which I don't know much uh, that much about Alfred. I do apologize, everyone. I know I fail, uh, but um, it just seems to be a thing with him. Uh, so it's not just me though, Don. It it is a thing with him. <laughs> it is definitely a thing with him. Um, another thing that just occurred to me compared to the last two movies that I uh, spoke with you about, both sure. Vertigo and Rear Window, yes. this is a movie in which the um, the hero is actually a hero and not a creepy asshole. Yes, you're, you're, you're right. He is actually a hero. He's... He's a straight up guy. He's a businessman, you know, a really successful one, apparently. Um, you he's, know. he's genuinely a nice guy trying mm -hmm. to do his best. Sure, he's had a couple of failed marriages. Sure, he's a mama's boy. But um, it's 1959. Who's guy? What guy isn't, right? No. <laughs> well, you know, he hasn't killed and mummified his mother yet. So oh, no. that's good. That's At least good. the girl got to him in time this time. <laughs> <laughs> he managed to get a girlfriend before he went he went that route with it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise you could you could totally see Thornhill turning into Norman Bates. Yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Mother's in the other room. Uh, well, you know, there's that one scene in the elevator where the two henchmen are chasing him and he throws all that those women in between them. And it's yeah. he's exiting the elevator. So you know, oh, it, ladies first, <laughs> ladies first, ladies first. And then he runs off his mom's yeah. screaming. <laughs> You're going to be home for dinner later, right? Yeah. <laughs> she <was a> <laughs> trip. Played by oh, JC yeah. Royce Landis. Uh, yeah. I liked his mom. His mom was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we get in here as Roger Thornhill tries to figure out why everybody thinks he's this, this spy. We have the real U.S. folks who are behind spying. Yes, the CIA in here. <laughs> My son made an observation, which is why I bring them up. Um, he's like, why is it only the police officers seem to have guns in this movie? <laughs> He's like, the bad guys, uh, you know, I mean, Eve had the gun with blanks in it. Um, you know, and the one bad guy had one little peen shooter, but for the most part, these guys are, don't seem to be wielding around any heat. What the hell? And neither is the CIA. <laughs> like, I, the heck? I think that's a Hitchcock device specifically. Is it really? I wouldn't be surprised. He is more cerebral. He yeah. wants people to fight with their brains and with their mm -hmm. psychology and with their emotions. Well, I, I think mean, that's really, I mean, it's not that they don't have access to it. It's just not their first, their first thing, their first weapon of choice. 
Well, there. if you watch this, this is as close as you're ever going to get to Alfred Hitchcock, I think, doing a James Bond movie. Mm. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. <laughs> I mean, from from the villains to the way Roger handles himself to, as we mentioned, the situations with no guns. This, so I'm not the only one who feels this is this is like a very much handled like a James Bond film. I, it actually made me wonder if the people, the the filmmakers who did uh, the James who went on to do the James Bond movies a couple of years later saw this movie said, Oh my God, this is the way to do a spy movie. Except we don't want the red herring spy. We want the real spy. Because if, if you think about it, there's so much, there is so many parallels. There's the, um, there's the convoluted plot. Yes. <laughs> Um, there's the, the huge drama and adventures, um, and then there's the color schemes. There's a lot of color schemes and cinematography that in this movie that easily would be com comparable to the, uh, James Bond movies. Cause what, this was 59. The first James Bond movie, Dr. No, was what, 62, 63? I think so. Because Doctor No, Something yeah, like Doctor No was the first one. So um, sixty-two was Doctor No. So I mean, it's entirely possible they're both British. Well, no, MGM obviously. Yeah. Um, but Hitchcock was a British filmmaker. Bond is a British film, a series franchise. Yeah. Well, it, it, just, there were just a lot of parallels that were creeping up with the mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. Thornhill handled himself. I mean, when he first gets kidnapped. He tries once to escape, but then he sits down and has banter with these guys to try to figure out what's going on. He's put in a room before he sees, you know, the fake Townsend, who is actually Van Damme, and they have a dis exchange similar to Bond. I mean, you know, the auction house was totally a Bond move. And you're sitting here going, I'm watching this going, oh, my God. <laughs> You know what other movie, and and again, another completely aside, you know what other movie that a whole auction house scene made me think of? Mm. And you, seriously? What? Hudson Hawk. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it was it was like Hudson Hawk, wa the, the filmmakers of Hudson Hawk watched this and wanted to homage it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, there. it also had the Hudson Hawk feel mm. to it. Um, But yeah, just the way... Roger Thornhill interacts with Philip Van Dam every time. It reminded me of, you know, old Bond sitting down at the poker table across from the villain. He knows he's the villain. The villain knows he's the spy. But they're sitting there being very cordial and bantering with words. So would that make Leo G. Carroll M? Oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> the professor they call him the professor they do <laughs> he's the guy that arranges things in the background he, yeah, he he arranged eve's blanks so they could pose as uh, you know as it looked like she was actually killing roger thornhill uh, uh -huh. in the very public place he arranged some other things the professor and leonard played martin landau beautifully is the odd second uh, right hand man who mm -hmm. is the scariest guy who's scarier than your main villain yeah he uh, is <laughs> yeah as i'm watching this the more and more parallels of bond i was like you know he sits down and he has a drink you know he, he has his drink ready for him he, he's he, it's like wow <laughs> it's <laughs> he, he, okay speaking of drinks Cary grant's drink of choice I would you, I want some scotch. Was it scotch that he asked for? Scotch bourbon. With water. Yeah, uh, no, scotch, scotch with scotch. water, but no ice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I it, it you can't help you can't help it. There's just too many of those similarities. When Thornhill is playing the role of the spy, you look at it going, "My God, that's Bond." <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> He gets his suit pressed. He's with the femme fatale. He knows 
you know, there's something up with her. And, and yeah, a lot of cat and mouse back and forth. Um, ah, yeah, it, there has to be, there has to be influence of Thornhill in your Bond character. It's, it's hard to miss, I think, if you're just looking. I would love, and, and I've only got this one on VHS, so I, I have not been able to see any documentary, or not documentaries, but any commentaries or anything like that. But I would love to see if um, the screenwriter, um, <clears throat> Ernest Lehman. Yeah. I would love to see if he was even remotely influenced by Ian Fleming's novels. <laughs> it would be interesting to see because the, it, it you could you it feels that way. It really has that feel to it. Um, I mean, because nobody could claim that this was influenced by the movies simply because there's no way. Right. This yeah, one no. obviously came first, but it it would be curious. I would be curious to find out if Ernest Lehman had read those novels. And and took an idea of hey, what if Bond was actually just a common guy? Yeah, or yeah. even even if not, yeah, yeah. But they yeah. did they did they did do a fantastic job. I mean, from the cinematography to the suspense, the scene. Oh my gosh! Speaking of cinematography and just talent in general, that scene after. Uh, Thornhill was kidnapped, first kidnapped and taken to the UN, uh, or he goes not the UN, the the um the, the mansion, Townsend, yeah. Um, yeah, the Townsend mansion, and they poured the bottle of bourbon in him, and then they had that whole scene of him drunk driving down the twisty roads of the California uh, highways. Hey, well, okay, I'm sorry. Wow. That wasn't California, even though it was very obviously California. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was very, very obviously Southern California, but it was yeah. not supposed to be. It was supposed to be somewhere in New York. Um, watching Cary Grant make those faces. Yep. At my first reaction was, God, that's so overplayed. And then I'm like, wait, no, really? Somebody that drunk? would probably be making those kind of faces. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> that that was my thought process. My, mine too. I, I was thinking that. Also, I was thinking that going, wow, I could see Jimmy Stewart this role. Uh, <laughs> which I don't know if, I think he was considered for it. I'm not sure, but um, uh, which I think would have played off completely differently. Uh, he was doing something else at the time, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, see Cary Grant make those faces when he's drunk as he's he's winding down the road. And there's some cool, yes, <laughs> excuse me. Yes, we know. He's, you've got the old school rear projection going on. Okay, yeah, we understand that. But there's a cool shot too, though, where it makes me miss hood ornaments on cars. <laughs> yes. It really does because, um... With the added hood ornament, we get shots as he's going down the hill. We get shots of that's supposed to be from his point of view of he's coming up on stuff. And the hood ornament is a, it's a Merce I believe it's supposed to be Mercedes or whatnot. So it's like a crosshair hood ornament. So it, it, it gives that extra little edge of tension, I think, because it's like you get a tree in the crosshair, you know, the, the middle of the car, you get another car in the car. I thought that added something to it that if you didn't have the hood ornament there in all honesty, I'm not sure it'd be as um as powerful of a of a scene as tense because it, you know for me it just gave it a little extra oomph. I don't know, what'd you feel? Oh, I agree with that. It was it was a very good device to have. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> It was a very good device to have and probably, well, obviously it was the equivalent of, of um, some of our 3D 
uh, oh, yeah. first person perspective, things that we do now, probably one of the precursors of that. Yeah. That made people want to get better at doing it. Oh, yeah, def definitely. Um, and again, Alfred Hitchcock has a film where he has someone drunk driving like he did in Notorious. Um, which, it's fun watching these movies from him because you're fine. You find some common elements across the board, whether or not it's intentional or it just happens that he picks a script with it in it. Um, you, you get some of these, you seem to be, get these common elements, which makes you wonder how much input Alfred had on the scripts. You know, uh, I'm assuming he probably did quite a bit. I would uh, imagine. Because it well that ends Alfred, so you know. <laughs> yes, so, he had a he had a signature everything. He he did, and even he makes a cameo very early in the film. Oh, I loved this cameo. This was one of my favorites. Oh, well, you want to tell the folks about uh, the Alfred cameo in this one? I was so at the beginning of this film, a bus pulls up to a bus stop opens and people get in and alfred hitchcock runs up to the bus the bus door closes in his face but the added little bit that makes me love this scene so much is that his name they have uh, right then his credit is up directed by alfred hitchcock and as he runs on screen his name slides off screen as if he's chasing it yes <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was, that's a great cameo. And then he also he does a little bit of acting to where he runs into the closed door of the bus and he just looks disappointed. Yes. He, he looks so disappointed. Uh, so so you say you uh, this has one of your favorite villains. What is it about Philip Van Damme that you enjoy so much? It was, I mean, we pretty much covered, we covered a lot sure. of it. We did. Um, okay. Uh, it was the whole dynamic with mm -hmm. Philip Van Damme and his henchman, Victor. Um, they had a great relationship, a very complicated relationship. Um, and it was that vi Bond villain mm -hmm. feel you got from it. Um, he was very... The, with the whole movie being a much more light and fun film, this villain... He was more. He was a a lighter. I don't know. I'm not. I'm. I'm no, not. I get, I get what you're saying. I mean. no, I he wasn't like in like in Vertigo. The hero was also the villain, right? And the vi the true villain of the piece was just a really. Uh, he wasn't. He was kind of an absentee villain, but in this one with Van Damme and. And uh, Leonard, they were more of the caricature of a villain, mm -hmm. but they were still believable. Right. Well, you know, what's interesting with the Van Damme villain is Leonard, Leonard is more of the uh, cold-blooded killer, I think, in many ways than uh -huh. Van Damme is. I mean, Van Damme will kill if, out of necessity. I mean, he talks about it once he realizes that Eve is a double agent. He talks about dumping her out of a plane once they get high, you know. But even then, when he's but that's just business. When he's mentioning or whatnot, it it doesn't seem like yeah. He he. It, it's more of just business. He's more of the guy of I would rather run away with my microfilm in my little uh, statue than I would want to go on and shoot my way out of things. Uh -huh. You know. And and Leonard was definitely as as with anybody who's in love, they will protect what they love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Leonard was was by far the more uh, vicious of the two. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and yeah, he, he, yeah, Van Dam. He, he actually seemed like he had a little bit of you know soft soft side to him, whereas Leonard not quite as much. <laughs> Which again, yeah. as we've mentioned already, there's that bond type of dynamic between those two. So, mm -hmm. and I really did like that. 
a lot. It it was not only entertaining, they were both, both James Mason and Martin Landau are so charismatic. Um, my first movie that I ever saw with James Mason was Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yes. So, and then um, the last movie that I saw that I, rem that I vividly remember with him was Yellowbeard. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't don't question my taste. I have awesome taste. I, I don't at all. I just, <laughs> um, so James Mason to me has always been an incredibly diverse, wonderful actor, and to see him in this was just just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And and to be able to kind of make that click with that Bond villain type character in an Alfred Hitchcock film. And for him to do it so exquisitely well, yeah, yeah, it it made for a memorable moment. And I know we don't talk about it; we haven't talked about it too much in the other Alfred Hitchcock movies because we were a little short on time. We've got some time yet tonight. We have to talk about the integral player in Alfred Hitchcock films, Mr. Bernard Herman. And his score for North by Northwest. Don, what's your opinion about this score for North by Northwest? Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I noticed it less in this one than I did in Vertigo. I'm, it, I'm a terrible person. No, not at all. Actually, but, there's, a, there's a lot more moments in here where there's no music, though. Uh, yeah, and and I'm I was just going to say I'm wondering if that was an intentional thing because in 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 movies like Vertigo and Psycho the score is so intense and it, that they're that they're almost a character of their own in Rear Window the score was essentially absent mm -hmm. and in this one. It was, I, I, I didn't notice it. I, it was there and I know it, I know it was there, but it wasn't so intense the way it was in Vertigo, which we talked about last week that I didn't, it didn't occur to me. Outside of the, the opening music, which if there is ever a theme that's going to get you jazzed up for a film, <laughs> <laughs> the North by Northwest opening music is is just fantastic in that you're just sitting there going, oh, I want, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he, he fires you up so much and you only get the musical cues, not as you mentioned, they, they aren't quite as prevalent as in some of the other movies uh, that Alfred and Bernard Herrmann had done. Yet when it is there, it, it is well done. And I've listened to the score many times. I've, I've enjoyed it. But that's because this film does have a lot of moments where there isn't score, particularly in the one that this film is most famous for, which, in all honesty, I'm not quite sure. I mean, for 59, though, it was a pretty bold scene with the crop duster. But yeah. You know, watching it again, I haven't watched it for a long time, but watching it again, everybody, you know, that's they'd say that's like an iconic scene or whatnot. I'm like, you know, I'm I don't know if it really is or not. Maybe it's because of the time period it came out and it was a very impressive stunt, especially for that time. But what's more impressive with me about that scene is they could have gone with a score, but correct me if I'm wrong, Don, they don't I don't have think I think you're right. I think they really didn't do much with that. I think it was all supposed to be just the tension of the moment and and I want to say this right. Um, the tension of the moment and the vacuum of silence as your uh, heart beats in your ears and you mm -hmm. really can't hear anything because it over the sound of your own heartbeat. Right. No, and that's exactly what he's going for in that, that scene. And it's an intense scene. Don't get me wrong, folks. I just, I always think it's funny that that's kind of the scene that everybody remembers. And there's some other more, I think more important, uh, uh, visually stunning scenes in here than that one. Um, 
but yeah, you're right. It, it, there, you don't have a score filling up the background, so you get the dead air in between the strafing run from the crop duster, um, and you, you're following, you know, uh, it, Roger trying to to avoid not getting killed. Um, and it's so beautifully shot. It is fantastically shot, but you're right. It, 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 there's no score because they want you to kind of keep the tension of the moment. And it's a very effective moment, um, including the fact that he gets a uh, really nasty DDT at the time because it's 59. So the pesticide he gets dumped on him was nasty. <laughs> yeah. That was. Nasty. And they didn't pretend it was anything other than nasty either. Well, no, because you get that really cool in the beginning. You get this great shot because. Uh, uh, Rogers sent out a wild goose chase by Eva to get out to this location where he's meant to get killed. So before the plane comes into uh, play, Rogers just sitting down waiting and thinking he's going to meet the actual spy. And there's this cool shot of him and this other guy in the flattest part of Indiana known to man. And Indiana's flat, but this is flat. <laughs> there's a great two shot in here between those two. Um, it is a great setup, but he walks up to the guy and starts talking to him, who's a local waiting for the bus. And the guy goes, oh, look at Crop Duster. He goes, was it, uh, you make a pretty penny or whatnot if you survive? So, yeah, he said something like that. And he also then made some sort of comment. Yeah, he did. And then after that, he made the comment about it dusting in the wrong place. But yeah, that was... Hey, yeah, that was quite the statement to make. <laughs> wow. It, it caught me. I'm like, wow, here we have this kind of, you know, this sub character, basically, this kind of side character. And they're looking at the crop duster and he drops this line. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, I suppose at the time they would, it would be something that they would be thinking about is mm -hmm. how dangerous farming was at that time. Right. Yeah, and the chemicals being used and such. Um, and, yeah, it just surprised me there was a line like that in there. Uh, and then, yeah, he's crop dusting in the wrong place, which should have been a little bit more of a warning sign for our uh, our man, but not quite. Uh, <laughs> and it's still a great scene. It, it's a fantastic scene. Um, especially how it ends <laughs> with the crash. <laughs> oh, yeah. At that those models were really well made. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it shot for that, especially for the time period. And I know I bring it up, but it, it's still, you got to put it in context, but for the time, it really was rather seamless <laughs> mm -hmm. in there. Um, so yeah. And, Oh, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get close to wrapping it up for the night, but a lot of great cinematography in here. Great. You get that scene on Mount Rushmore and, you know, the <laughs> plain scene. Is there a scene in particular uh, that we may not have already talked about, Don, that just stood out for you that you really like, like a shot, uh, that they particular shot that they do in the film or something that, uh, or a, a scene that really just stood out to you that just made you like, wow. I think we talked about most of them. We talked okay. about... The, we talked about the scene in the in the dining cart. We talked right. about we talked about the the when in the auction house. Mm -hmm. We talked about the ha, we talked. You brought up the planes. Yes. Um, where she shot him with the blanks. We talked about the scene towards the end. The oh, how about that house? The Is the it homage to. It was an homage to um, Frank Lloyd Wright. It was not an actual Frank Lloyd Wright house. It was a set. You read my mind. Yes. <laughs> I was, I, what I said, <laughs> folks, we're from the Midwest. Cut us a break. <laughs> but when I saw the house, I was like, that's a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Yeah, it, it, it was, was, yep. It was a set designed to look like a Frank Lloyd Wright house down to the interior decoration. That good. was something I looked up. Okay. <laughs> so I'm good. like, whoa. <laughs> good. It's not just me because folks, we, 
No. Especially when you're from this area of the country, when you see a house the way this house looks in North by Northwest, you're going, holy crap, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright house. <laughs> Good. So I, I'm glad you yep. brought it up. You read my mind because that was the first thought I had when I watched that, when I saw the house was, oh, well, I didn't think there was a Frank Lloyd Wright house out there. <laughs> you know? Uh, well, you know, it, it's a little bit west, but yeah. not quite the Midwest, but almost the Midwest. I mean, a Frank Lloyd, think about it, though. What a concept, a Frank Lloyd Wright house built on top of Mount Rushmore. Yeah, right. That would be awesome. That that would be, that'd be awesome. I, I'd like that house. That'd be cool. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> good. I'm just, I'm glad I, I wasn't the only one who thought that. Um, for me, I act the scene I actually like, and I know most of it was a painting, but I just thought it was really cool, and it 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 reinforces why I wanted to do eight weeks of Hitchcock, and I was so glad the crew were excited for this because you look at Hitchcock, he's one of those earlier big name filmmakers, and you can see his influences on modern filmmakers because he did stuff you didn't quite normally see. For films of the time and there's this scene it's it's small i know but there's uh in the un uh roger is uh, seeking out who he thinks is the guy who kidnapped him at the un and it's a completely different guy though it's the same name so he realizes uh things are are not as they seem and then that un guy gets killed and people think that roger did it so he goes running out of the UN and Alfred puts in this shot. That's a top down from like the top of the UN to where there's a taxi cab and Roger is running to the taxi cab. And he looks like a little ant, but it's just shot with the way the color was. It just, it, it was awesome to see. <laughs> I'm like, that, that's an awesome shot. Yeah. I know most of it's matte painting, but still, it, it's still the man the man was a genius just a visual artist i mean we talk about i mean the people that came after him like kubrick but mm -hmm. truly the man was a visual artist well yeah well, you get this scene in the train when uh roger is first hiding on the train he's hiding in the bathroom from the conductors who are checking tickets before you see him, we get the standard camera that's along the side of the train. And you're like, okay, you, you get that. The establishing shot, the train's moving, okay. But instead of cutting to the inside, Alfred moves the camera from outside into the train car. And I know it's small, but he does that again later on. It was such a cool shot. And you're just like, that's really neat. He did that. <laughs> You know, he, he moves from outside of the train to inside of the train to where the move, you know, where the action's going on and tries to make it look seamless, like it's just one continuous shot, which it might have been. Um, but I just thought that was pretty impressive, especially for the size of cameras that they had back then. Uh -huh. You know, Most so, you, definitely. so there's there's stuff, there's shots in here. The cinematography in here is just is just crazy i mean <clears throat> yeah some of it you can tell they're behind a screen and whatnot and, and you'll get that with a film like this but some of these scenes are just you're like wow <laughs> you're like, i did not expect to see that in here you know and so yeah i i thought it was uh i think it's visually impressive yeah uh, robert burks is a cinematographer in here who i think did pretty much uh, a good chunk of Alfred's films. Um, uh, let's see real quick here. Pardon me. But yeah, he did The Man Who Knew Too Much, Trouble with Harry, Rear Window, Dial M for Murder. Yeah, this is Alfred's man. Uh yeah. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock really liked working with the same people because once he got them trained, that was it. They knew what he wanted. All he had to say was, I want this. And they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Which 
you know, uh, is cool. <laughs> it's cool that he, uh -huh. he wanted to work with the same people because especially they, by this point, the cinematographer and him would probably be so much on the same page because they oh, did, absolutely. you know, so many films together. So they finally, they get to hear and yeah, it's, uh, you can tell really, uh, that they're in sync and it, it makes for such cool visuals in a film that, uh, yeah. So, uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap up it tonight dawn if there unless there's a topic or subject we didn't cover that you maybe wanted to talk about nope i'm pretty sure we got everything that was on my my little notepad <laughs> yeah i i think so too uh, so we'll wrap it up tonight hope this wet your whistle for north by northwest if you haven't seen it it's more than just the crop duster scene <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> and after watching it tonight before the show it's a precursor to bond films I'll, I'll stand by that. I think Dawn will too. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So I hope you're enjoying these eight weeks of Hitchcock. We got um, some great stuff coming. Uh, I, I, next week, I believe I'm doing uh, uh, The Birds will be next. So uh, you'll want to stay tuned for that. We're coming near the end of the year, but uh, as well. So, uh, look for some other great things on our channel and such. And Don, uh, I know uh, you don't do as much writing as you used to, but where can people still find your written word? If you really want, you can find me in the audience.net. Absolutely. Check it out. She has some great written reviews up there of films that you may or may not have heard of, but once you read her reviews, you may want to seek them out. So, Great stuff there. Thank you, Don, for talking North by Northwest. And now I think we'll just say good night. Good night. Good night. Hey, all my friends out there looking for more spoiler room goodness? Then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive spoiler room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at SpecialMarkPro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the spoiler room, as well as just how we're doing in general. We appreciate your support, and remember in the spoiler room, the conversation is fresh, but we do spoil the movies. <laughs>